Hello, everyone. We'll just give people a second to pop right in. What is happening here? No, wrong way. Can everybody hear me all right? We're just going to give people a second to pop in. I have my glasses on so I can read your guys' comments. Okay, let's get started. So today we are going to be joined by Michael Sasser, who happens to be an amazing boudoir photographer in LA. I absolutely adore his work. I got to meet him in um, in LA when I was there. Oh, hello! All the all the messages are popping up now. Okay, so let's let's welcome Michael. Hello, hey, Michael. Hey. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I just as as always before my, my before any live stream, YouTube live stream, Instagram live stream. I just always scramble. I'm like, I need to make tea. I need to do this. I need to do that. And it's just. It's always yeah. a scramble. I always make sure I've got a bottle of water. Got to got to stay hydrated. Same. You know? I got my I got my tea. My famous tea mug at this point. Okay, so um, uh, let me introduce you. You are a boudoir photographer based in um, LA. You also happen to be an amazing YouTuber. You create really cool content for this channel here or for this platform. Um, so tell us a bit about yourself. When did you start with boudoir? Uh, I started with boudoir officially about like seven years ago. It was 20, 2013. Um, I just kind of randomly stumbled into it. Uh, I've, I had shot one or two paid shoots before, but they were like one like offshoots, uh, friends mm -hmm. of friends that just sort of uh, kind of random. <clears throat> and I started to do it in the wintertime. I was living in Denver. I wasn't shooting weddings in the wintertime because it was snowing. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, uh, there was this workshop that I went to and it made it look pretty simple. And so I just decided I was going to start, start taking boudoir clients. And that was in 2013. And for the last four to about four full years, I've been exclusively boudoir. So I don't shoot weddings. I don't shoot high school seniors. I don't shoot headshots. I don't shoot uh, kind of anything other than, uh, other than boudoir is my only photography income. That must be a great feeling that having to, you know, deal with, with clients, like for, especially for weddings, I find for myself when I started photography, it was such a daunting thing to just have to do weddings. <laughs> yeah. just... I mean, nothing against everybody's got their thing, right? So some people, uh, I mean, it, it, very simple, like I'm in Los Angeles because I love the warmth. Some people really love skiing mm -hmm. or they love hiking or they love whatever. And so they're in that place doing that. For me, like boudoir is where my heart is. Um, some people are like weddings are the best. Like let's have a party. I love spending time with the couples. And that just... Um, I just didn't get I just didn't get that much out of it, so mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm very happy with where I'm at. Absolutely. Do you know what? Before we actually get on it, before I start asking a question, so I'll ask Michael a bunch of questions, and then you guys can jump in as well and ask him questions if you if you feel like there's something that you want to know. I'm just going to post it to my Instagram story, just a little quick. Oh yeah, good idea. <laughs> good idea. Cool. I'll just post that very quickly so people know that we are live, and then we'll get going with the juicy questions for michael i hope everybody's doing well how are you guys doing um is the quarantine treating you well how is how is the quarantine and where you are is it like um are you going to be released soon or i love that term released um, yeah i know <laughs> yeah it's uh it's been fine uh we've got our stay-at-home order is officially until may 15th um same well, I, I expect they're going to push it back. I think they're going to push it back more, but they, at first it was mm -hmm. April 30th. And then on April 15th, they pushed it to May 15th. So mm -hmm. I thought for sure on the 1st of May, they were going to say May 30th, but they haven't yet. So okay. I don't know. I mean, that would be great uh, to be able to start taking clients. I'm not going to take any clients until June anyways. Um, yes. But yeah, I mean, it'd be great to start working again. It would be great to, you know, get a few things, uh, kind of back to normal life, even still, even without that, um, it's still going to be, you know, life's different now for sure. Oh, for sure. I mean, I'm stuck in Ireland here until they release me into the actual world because I can't work here. So it's just like, I'm kind of trying to do like um, social distancing photo shoots here, or sorry, um, FaceTime photo shoots. And I've attempted self portraits. I failed miserably. I'll be probably trying again tomorrow. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. I, I posted on my story. 
oh, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just, just like I only have like, practice, right? it's just like, I only have like an hour or two of light where I like it in my room. So I have to like literally just like, it's, it's between like 9.30 and 11.30 in the afternoon and that's it. So it's just like, I have a very skinny like window of time to just like experiment and then half the time there's clouds as well. So it's just like, you get ready. I spend like an hour in my hair makeup and then it's just like, nope, not happening. Okay. So, um, I will start with the question. So as I said, I have a few of them. So um, how to start your own boudoir business and how to book your first models when you don't have a portfolio? Uh, that's a good question. You know, boudoirs, I love boudoir. Um, there is, so I just want to do a quick uh, brief uh, boudoir versus uh, versus like glamour, like with models real quick. Yeah. Uh, even, though, even though it might help to book some models first before you start your boudoir business. Um, just quick definition. Um, models are, you know, they're in front of the camera a bunch. You're shooting every week. They're posting mm -hmm. to their Instagram, things like this. My typical boudoir client is like an everyday woman. She's a mom of, she's got some kids. She's in her thirties. She's, uh, she's got a regular job, but for this, she wants to get pictures of herself. Um, I just got an inquiry last night that said she wanted to get a boudoir shoot so that she can prove to herself that she is actually sexy. So that's the okay. kind of clients that I'm getting. So <clears throat> Uh, in some ways, um, okay, so if you've never shot it before, my recommendation is always to ask friends and ask friends of friends uh, to start because you probably have some friends who would be comfortable doing it and they've never tried something like this before. Maybe they have. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if you guys have a good, uh, a good enough trust built between you, this is something you can just kind of enjoy and see what happens. So ask some friends, uh, ask them if they know anybody who would be curious. You'd be surprised how many people this has been on their list of things to do. They just haven't taken the time to find a photographer or they haven't been able to spend the money on it or, um, or it just hasn't really been a priority, but if the opportunity presents itself, they'll go for it. So very first thing, mm -hmm. get a couple images under your belt, start, start in those two places. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, the other things are just, you know, if you get some practice, practice under your belt, the rest is uh, the rest becomes much easier, but to start a boudoir business, you don't need that much. Um, I recommend you have like a, you know, a solid contract and a website mm -hmm. with some of your images on there. Talk about why you want to shoot boudoir in the first place. Cause it's a very personal, intimate thing, different than like commercial photography. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't say like this big thing about how, when you were little, you love t-shirts. And so you wanted to, you know, be a, be a, a commercial photographer <laughs> and sell t-shirts, yeah. you know? So boudoir is a little bit different in that way. And those sort of things I think can really help. Yeah, so one thing that I found very interesting on your page in particular when I was looking at it, I'll show it to you guys now. Um, you have those before and after kind of transformations for boudoir, which I think is really cool because um, I'll show it to you now. Um, and so while you're, while you're digging go. through that, I'll explain that a little bit. So, um, so the before and after pictures, again, you know, with a model, you wouldn't typically be like, this is a before and after uh, of a model. You just want to see the finished product. But for mm -hmm. uh, for my clients, these are just like that woman right there. She got married. This was uh, this was uh, the one above it was she was mm -hmm. turning 40 and she wanted to get some nice pictures for herself. And so the point is just to say, like, look, you may see these pictures and think like, wait a second, there's no way that I could. I could ever look like that. That woman like walks around in lingerie all day long. Yeah. Like, job. But the truth is, is that everybody, you know, wakes up in the morning and everybody's tired and everybody has days where they don't do their hair and everybody has, you know, that's who you are as a person every day. Um, so when you compare yourself to somebody that's already gone through, um, you know, some professional lighting and hair and makeup and mm -hmm. things like that, it's not really a fair comparison. So that does a really good job of connecting with my potential clients that might yes. have doubts. The way people say, um, mm -hmm. oh, well, she's a model, right? Yes. Well, if you see the before and after picture, you'll be able to identify with her as she is when she walks around throughout the day. It's the same person. I'm not saying that she only looks good if mm -hmm. she gets her professional pictures taken. I'm just saying that everybody has a bunch of different sides to them. And here's a side that you might more visualize yourself with. Mm -hmm. Know that you know this is it's not uncommon for us to get pictures that look like this. No, absolutely. And, you know, I, I mean, when you, for, for example, for me, if I like, let's say, look for a hairdresser, you know, I always look for their like before and after hair transformations, because it's the same kind of thing. I want to see 
what what can they work with you know and if i see somebody who let's say has similar hair to mine and then it looks amazing afterwards i'm like oh okay maybe they can look mine look great too and it's kind of i think the same here where it's like it's so i think it's so much nicer for a regular woman to see that you do shoot with regular women and not not supermodels because i feel like especially with boudoir it's such a tricky thing for like, for like, you know, self-esteem to be like, oh my God, I need to like get naked in front of this guy and like how like he's gonna judge me. But when you see other women doing that, women that look like you, like normal women, then you're like, oh, okay, maybe I can do it too. Absolutely. I think it's actually, with, I think with it's any of it, no matter what it is, basically what you're trying to do is you show them the final and then people in their heads come up with reasons why it wouldn't apply to them. Mm -hmm. right? We can take this all across the board. You see a really nice picture and you say, well, what camera was that shot with? Oh, okay. It was shot with that camera. So that doesn't apply to me. So that's why yeah. we do videos where we say, Hey, look, you can do it with this cheap camera. And all of a sudden they have to say like, wow, you can even do it with that camera. I guess the camera's not my excuse anymore. Now I need to yeah. find something else or I need to believe that I can do it. And it's the same. It's the same here. It's just people, people do a really, it's very comfortable for people to say like, oh, that wouldn't work for me because whatever. That person mm -hmm. isn't like me because of this. And so this is just a way to say like everybody's, you know, everybody's like you. Not not yeah. everybody's the same as you, but um, these are these are real everyday women just like just like you. Yeah, I think it's great. So um, people are t saying hi to us. Um, Wolvesley Jordan is asking when when are we coming to Barbados? Oh, I mean, I could. Oh, be. I'd love to. I would love to be in Barbados <laughs> like now. Believe me, I would. I would love to be in Barbados right now. Uh, Thank you so much, up. Deb. Thank you so much, Deb, for your um, donations. Um, what would you? Um, what would happen if you both change jobs for a week as a challenge? I don't think our jobs are this much different, to be honest. I mean, I guess the subjects. You know, you shoot more regular women, and I usually shoot with models. But at the end of the day, like the subject that we do shoot is pretty similar. I shoot bikinis, you shoot lingerie, so it's not like it's that out of the box. I but guess you with you, photographing, uh, one of the differences might be the end product. For sure, yeah, and I think in general, maybe also the fact that you know lingerie is usually a bit more sensual and it's not like you know bikinis are always a bit more like there's a bunch of colors and it's like mm -hmm. tan skin but like with with lingerie it's more about like the feel of the of the image and and you know and and the the sensual aspect of it rather than just like you know here is the girl at the beach so i think it would be definitely interesting i'm okay. actually i'm actually i'm actually getting more into shooting like nudes now obviously not right now because i'm in ireland but i am I did recently just post a photo. Um, yeah, it's definitely not as subtle as your work. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the that's the, kind of the whole point. Is everybody's got their own style, but at least for me, like I wouldn't know the first thing about pricing commercial work. Like if a swimwear company messaged me and was like, "Hey, how much do you charge?" I'd be like, "How many pictures do you usually want? Yeah, uh, yeah. what's the timeline? How much am I supposed to charge? Where do you mm -hmm. provide the model? Do I get them? Do I get the yeah. model?" So there's definitely yeah. still a bunch of things like that, and then. You know, for my clients, they're typically buying albums mm -hmm. uh, or wall art. These are two of my clients here. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have any idea about that. So I think those are the parts. Yeah, like the subject matter. Uh, yeah, they're still women, mm -hmm. they're still not wearing very, very much clothing. But I think it would be like the experience around it. Like, how do you talk to yeah. someone who's never been in front of the camera before? And conversely, how do you talk to somebody who does this as their job? Mm hmm you know yeah before. no absolutely you're right because it's like it does it does involve different types of direction okay so moving on for to my second question um how to build credibility on uh, online with your um with your boudoir business so i find that like credibility is one of the main things that builds trust and i uh -huh. think you need a lot of trust to to be able to look um to be able to book boudoir shoots because they want to know that you're not a fly by night kind of photographer. Yes. They want to know that this is your business, that you take this mm -hmm. seriously, that other people have had the experience, which is a little tricky when you're first getting started. But some of my main, main pieces of advice are uh, to collect reviews as yeah. many reviews as you can get um, yeah. the better. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, the easiest way I found is to just send them a link to your Yelp page Mm -hmm. and have them have them fill it out there. I've got a short link that's like 
uh, it's a tiny.cc slash sasser Yelp. And if you type that in, it mm-hmm. goes right to my Yelp page and it pops up to leave a review. So they just type something in then I can drag that to my website or collect thank you emails. Anytime yes. somebody do a thank you email, take that, put it on your website. You have just anytime somebody shows that they had a good experience, um, share that with other people. So that's one mm-hmm. of the best ways. I think that's one of the most honest ways to do it. There's other yeah. like, you can submit it to a, a contest and win a, you know, win a photo contest, but the contests are sometimes they're more legit. Sometimes they're not. I mean, the clients don't really know, but I think, I think past client experiences are really important. Another form mm-hmm. of credibility is uh, any kind of video that you have. Mm-hmm. So behind the scenes video of you shooting um, shows the realism that it is you shooting that you are um, good at what you do, that the your model is, your client is comfortable. Yeah. Uh, and that makes things look a lot more legitimate. That's another huge, huge thing I would do. And then mm-hmm. for boudoir specifically, again, um, is speaking to it from in, in like an honest perspective to where your client says, oh, this person actually does understand what I'm going through and why I want a boudoir shoot. And those sort of things can really um, just build belief that it's like, okay, you're hearing me. Yeah. And you're not just like, hey, why not shoot pictures of girls in underwear? It's mm-hmm. like, okay, he understands like the fears that I'm going through. He understands the yeah. hesitations. He understands those sort of things. So those are the probably the three biggest ones. Yeah, because I have to say when I was looking at your website, um, I won't be popping up on the screen here because there's too much nudity <laughs> and they're just if everywhere. You, if, you, if you go straight to the testimonial section, if you go info, yeah, okay. testimonials, Let's... there's no nudity there. <laughs> Uh, the portfolio page is the only one you have to watch out for. Okay, let's let's just do that. Um, yeah. We'll pop you on here. So we'll go into, so we'll where go is it? Info. Oh, yeah, testimonials. There we go. Yeah, so I that's think my, it's just... That's, that's, my, that's my about me page. Oh, yes. So roll over info. Testimonials. And- there we go. Oh, yeah, okay. Here we go. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, you see, I like, I love, I love the amount of information you have on the website because I think if I was coming from a perspective of someone who is just starting, you know, or who wants to do this kind of shoot, but I've never done it before, I think it would be amazing because it would make me feel so much more comfortable seeing that so many different people have done it already. Um, yeah, and not only, not only, I mean, the vast number of people is is huge, but the testimonials that are like mm-hmm. really heartfelt and that come from a place that uh, that the client can connect to. If it's just a testimonial that says, um, wow, I loved my pictures. Like that's not going to move yeah. to, mm-hmm. to want to shoot with you. You know, the realism of that is yes. so, so, so if you can do, um, and that'll just, that'll just come with time and you can coach your clients into it and just say like, Hey, I love a review. If you want to say what you were, uh, what you were fearful of, like mm-hmm. what made you nervous was the experience, what you expected, Um, What was it like to see your pictures for the first time? And then just guide them a little bit and just say, these are some things that most people want to hear, but these are some things, you know, what were you most nervous about? And then, Mm -hmm. then they can speak to that. Um, And then the next person that reads it, will see it instead of just hearing like, uh, wow, great pics. Yes. Um, Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. And would you say, would you say in terms of um, getting traffic or like getting bookings, would you get most of your bookings through your website or would you get some from your Instagram as well? So I just booked somebody on Instagram uh, last week, but that mm-hmm. pretty much never happens. Most of my following on Instagram is of photographers. Most of my language on Instagram is mm-hmm. toward photographers. It's inspiration. It's getting yes. stuff done. It's tips, things like that. Um, because I book enough Instagram work for here. Google. So yeah, yeah, so you can see I've got all my courses linked. My first highlights are yes. like courses, presets, YouTube, mm-hmm. um, things like that. And then I've got, um, yeah, majority of these are clients. If you click on them and nobody's tagged, that means it was a real life yes. client. If you mm-hmm. click on it and somebody is tagged. That means it was a model I shot for YouTube. But yes. yeah, so Instagram, you know, I love Instagram, but I personally don't use it too much for bookings. However, uh, there are a bunch of tips and tricks that you can use to use Instagram to get booking. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah. I've, um, LA's got a lot of people and um, I'm very high up in the search rankings for SEO. Mm-hmm. And I've built my website to build a lot of that trust to have the videos and all of those sort of things. So um, yeah. I get like 90% of my bookings from Google. 
It's pretty interesting because I'm the other way around. You know, I have a website, but I mostly use it to just, um, it's not even a portfolio. I mean, I have a portfolio on it, but I mostly use it to, to just um, have it as a shop for my presets. And any bookings that I have for clients or for uh, models, I usually get to Instagram, and that's my main kind of channel for me. So and you can I, do have that. Actually gotten, I have actually gotten one or two from YouTube as well, which was kind of interesting, where somebody would be like, it was actually, I remember one brand, the actual, I think, creative director was following me on YouTube and he reached out to me and he's like, oh, hey, like, I love your work. I was, te I was like learning from you about lighting. Like, would you do our shoot? And I'm like, sure. I love it. So. That's awesome. Yeah. It's different for everybody. I think, I think a lot of people get caught up in, oh, this person gets booked on SEO. I have to do my SEO or this person mm -hmm. gets booked on Instagram. Instagram is the only way. But the truth is different people have different personalities and different ways mm -hmm. that they like to connect. Some people mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's through Instagram. Some people that's through YouTube, some people that's through their website, but whatever yeah. it is, if you only spend a short amount of time on one before you jump to the next, it's not going to be that effective. Yeah. You have to commit, you have to commit to one. So if you're focused on getting a lot of your bookings through Instagram, then putting 90, 80, 80 or 90% of your time in Instagram and 10 to 15% of your time, 10 to 20% of your time in your website, um, then that's the way you should do it. Or you do it opposite. But I think too many people are like, oh, I heard this person booked that way. And then I heard this person booked that way. And then yeah. uh, they sort of do 10% on everything and, and nothing ends up working. So someone just asked, I just popped it on the screen here. What percentage of your business would you say come from word of mouth? Me personally, I don't get a ton from word of mouth. I don't get a ton of referrals. I know it's very common in the boudoir industry. Um, and I'm not as sure um, why I, it's not it's not huge for me. I do get repeat clients. I get clients that come in once and then a year later, two years later, they want to come mm -hmm. in and do it, do it again. But uh, yeah, I don't have a ton of word of mouth. I did when I first got started. When I first mm -hmm. got started, I got referrals from makeup artists, wedding planners, and things like that. But now okay. most of it, most of it really is through, um, most of it is through, you know, SEO. Yeah. Okay. So someone just asked also, um, does boudoir always include shots on a bed or in a bed? So a couple of photo shoots every year. I don't even, we don't even take a picture on the bed. Um, boudoir, the, the official definition of boudoir is a French word and it means a woman's bedroom. Now the okay. reason why it's called boudoir, um, photography is because it is typically of, of women in this intimate way and sort of the bedroom yeah. makes sense. However, boudoir has really evolved into um, the purpose of it. What is the purpose for the shoot? And to me, mm -hmm. to a lot of photographers, the purpose of a boudoir shoot is uh, to empower women to, uh, you know, usually in a very vulnerable state. Um, it's for the viewership of them instead of many things like this. So you don't, it doesn't need to be on a bed to do that. Um, mm -hmm. You can do it outdoors. You can do it on the beach. You can do it um, in a in a warehouse. You can do it. On yeah. The, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't really mm -hmm. matter. To me, boudoir is really about the purpose. Like when this is at the end of this shoot, you know, what did you walk into this shoot to do? Did you do it to promote yeah. your Instagram page? It's probably it's probably not really boudoir. Did you do it yeah. to, um, you know, overcome something? Did you do it uh, as a personal goal? Did you do it as a gift to somebody? Did you do it in these ways? They're yeah. really more, more boudoir. Um, so uh, going back to circling to the question about the bed, um, what would you say would be your ideal boudoir photo shoot? Would it be like a natural light photo shoot at the beach outdoors somewhere? Would it be indoors? Yeah. So I, I've done some shots of the beach and they're cool. Um, but I really like to have more environment. So the beach, you typically have water, sand, mm -hmm. some palm trees, something like that. I'm, you know, that's okay, but I want, I want more and I want them to have things to interact with, uh, with just mm -hmm. the sand, they can stand, they can lay, they can be on your knees But when you got furniture and stuff like that. So I would love to do like a beach bungalow shoot mm. with like, um, you know, uh, have nice wooden decks and have palm trees and palm fronds. Yeah. You could have uh, like the little cabana, um, the little palm trees hanging off as mm -hmm. the roofs and have, you know, yes. really nice light in there. You could do uh, beds that have the giant posts. A lot of, a lot of what Bali has, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that stuff is really cool, but that, that would be my idea. Like, an, like a blend of indoor outdoor mm -hmm. that has some furniture that they can interact with, but 
that also feels very um very open um and mm -hmm. casual i'd say would be would be the dream fair enough um and circling back to that um what do you think is more beneficial for your boudoir business having your own space like you're up because you shoot a lot at your own apartment right yeah so this is a officially a, a live workspace so yes uh, it's so would up. you say so would you say this is more beneficial versus you having to go into your client's home uh yeah so i would say the the benefits of having your own shoot space is you have a lot more control. So mm -hmm. for me, I can say this time of day, I'm, I do all my shoots. They start at the same time when the light is really good in the studio. I have control of that mm -hmm. at a, at the client's house. I don't really know what that is. I don't know what their space is, yeah. I don't know how much light there is. So that's one of the biggest benefits. The other big benefit is that I can shoot as much as I want here. So if I want to set up three YouTube shoots and then a couple of clients and then practice some selfies and then get a friend to come over or whatever, like I can shoot as much as I want here. So that is massive for me. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have a shoot space, pretty much any second bedroom can turn into a shoot space. Uh, in my, yeah. in, when I first moved to LA, I shot in uh, the living room of my, of my apartment. We didn't have a bed. We had bad light. I shot in there anyways. I earned it was fine, so you could do it. But uh, I've heard this uh, this other photographer, Marco Ibanez, he shoots in other people's places. And the way he words it to his clients is he says, you know, you're going to be in um, for your comfort. And because the story is kind of about you, it makes sense to shoot in your space mm -hmm. because we're going to be more comfortable and we want to, you know, that sort of a scenario. And so he spins yeah. it as a positive instead of a negative. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think having if you can have your own space, it's great. But only if it's make only if it's making you more money. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, at the end of the day, I think I guess the positive would be um, depending on the clients that you get. If you happen to get clients who happen to have to have like really nice bedrooms or really nice spaces. I remember because like when I first started photography, I did very like very sparse like two or three shoots that were kind of boudoir as well. Or it was more mostly just my friends, and they were like, "Oh, I just want a present for my for my boyfriend or whatever." And um, it was it was like this two sided coin that in one way it was great because I would get to go and like you know shoot at their place, but at the same time you have no control over anything. You don't know what their light is like. You don't know what their space is like. What if it's really dark? What if it's very like um, you know tight? So there's so many elements that you have no control over, and I feel like especially because because you mainly work with natural light, right? You don't really use strobes that much. I use 100% natural light. That's correct. There you so. go. So, so I think, especially in this kind of situation, it kind of puts more pressure on you. Okay. Um. Sorry. Somebody just asked. I have this question up for uh, a, a while. Do you spend a lot on advertising? If so, which platforms do you advertise on? So for me, uh, for Boudoir, I only spend money on in one area on advertising, and that is my search engine optimization. I hired a company. Mm -hmm. uh, it's $250 a month, and that's my that's my marketing cost for the year. Um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, that's all I do. I have run some Facebook ads in the past that have been successful, but I, I book enough now that I don't need to do that. Uh, what about mm -hmm. you? I spend absolutely zero on advertising. <laughs> I genuinely like, uh, cause the main way I make money right now is obviously like YouTube, um, mostly sponsorships cause like YouTube ad revenue is just, especially now is just disgusting um and it's my presets so i just advertise my presets on every single one of my videos at the end and that's how it brings traffic so um other than that i've never like I, i've advertised I've, adver I've advertised my website before um but that was back in the day a few years back and now i genuinely just don't don't do anything because to be honest to be perfectly honest i just don't know how and it's just i feel like anytime i try to spend on advertising i would just waste money because i wasn't doing it the right way and i think that's the problem here so unfortunately yeah. that's where we're at um let me, uh, let me answer this quick question from yuma are skinny people sure. suitable for boudoir yeah so basically basically the answer to this is that anybody is suitable for boudoir mm -hmm. uh the whole point of boudoir is that it's about you it's about the person it's not about the photographer or what the photographer is trying to create or what's the photographer's vision or brand or anything. It's about it's about the person. So if you're skinny or if you're curvy or if you're tall or if you're short or if you're, you know, light skin or dark skin, it, it doesn't really matter because the pictures are for you and they're about you. So it doesn't it, it doesn't need to apply. One of the one of the differences is that I don't typically know what my clients look for 
before they show up for their photo shoot because they're just hiring me mm -hmm. to take pictures of them, which would be different if it was a commercial shoot and we're trying to find somebody that fits this description that's going to connect with this type of a person that is their target market, all that sort of thing. So it's really, I mean, really for everybody. Mm -hmm. So someone asked, this is a bit of a longer question, um, how do you contact brands to shoot uh, their, uh, for them? Is it advisable or recommended to reach out to people to do paid boudoir shoots if no one is contacting you for these services? I think from my no, perspective, one. yeah, like, I mean, from, from my perspective, uh, how they, con I don't really contact brands because it's, again, I'm in, in a bit of a different situation because when I started shooting swimwear, I was already a YouTuber, so a youtuber um but, you know i wasn't i wasn't really shooting swimwear for the clients i was shooting swimwear because i was enjoying it and i had a platform to do it on youtube so it's a bit different i do sometimes get requests from i mean i, I get regular requests from swimmer brands asking me about my fees um i would possibly maybe reach out if you ever shot like for example a lot of the times i contact brands and i'm like hey can you give me a bikini for a photo shoot because that's mostly what i care about i don't really care about the paid aspect but sometimes if i do happen to like let's say shoot with a cool model or something i can go and be like hey um you know i'll speak to the model first we'll decide what our fee is and be like hey we are going to charge let's say i don't know two hundred dollars per hour it's not what it is but that's usually like let's say and then we divide it between ourselves and then be like you know this is this is what we can deliver we can deliver like i don't know six images two looks per hour blah 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 um and then they either say yes or they tell you to just get lost and you know <laughs> hey get lost hey get lost <laughs> um yeah so for me is it advisable or recommended to reach out to people to do paid boudoir shoots if no one is contacting you for your services. So um, there are ways to market yourself and to set up shoots. Uh, not necessarily, I would never message someone and say, hey, I see, you know, I found your profile. I wanted to know if you wanted to pay me to take your picture. I probably wouldn't do that. But there are ways after you accumulate your following to get them to message you for uh, a sale that you're running or if you do... Um, you know, we put together a end of quarantine sale for one of the uh, for one of my students, one of my photography students. Um, she had people in her Facebook group, but nobody was booking. So, like, what do I do if nobody's telling me that they want to book? So, we set up a sale um, that basically gave them a little discount on the shoot fee. They still had to pay full price for all of their pictures, but she ended up booking seven photo shoots in a day, which was so wow. awesome um, to go from like you know not really booking to that. And uh, it's yeah. it's a lot in the way that you say it, but the broad strokes of it are that um, you make something limited, something rare, all, you know, people want something that they, um, that only has limited time. They don't want to miss out. That's where fear of missing out comes from. So you just have a limited time. Hey, limited time. Uh, I'm taking two shoots for this reason. Um, typically my shoots are X amount today. Only they're, they're this amount. Um, and the first two people, you know, get access after that. Yeah. Uh, the the pricing goes back up. So there are things that you can do there to create demand. Uh, but I would never necessarily just like reach out and say, hey, hey, you, you know, do you want to pay me for pictures? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it, there's there's a, a very subtle way to approach those kind of things. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the time you do kind of have to wait for people to come to you or find ways, as you said, to maybe like advertise yourself in a different way rather than um, just straight on like, you know, being like, hey, pay me. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. when you kind of approach people like that, they're like, no, I won't. And then that's it. Um, so somebody asked me, uh, Wolsey Jordan asked, um, what, most of my shoots are in Bali. Why Bali? Because just Bali is amazing. That's the that's best. Why. <laughs> I've lived in Bali on and off for uh, kind of over a year and a half now. Um, obviously, I'm in Ireland here, but I am planning to go back once this whole situation is over. Um, I just love it there. I think the 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 scene is so good michael you've been there so you you've seen you've seen the lifestyle you've Ridiculous. got a taste of the lifestyle yeah, it's just for me, it's yeah. super cheap it's super beautiful there's amazing models there beautiful locations you can shoot in most of them for free um so it's just it's just the perfect place to be to be honest um so someone asked sir gray what uh, the recommended lens for boudoir photography and best settings so um, I have a YouTube video on this. If you just type in best boudoir lens, it'll pop up. 
Um, it was actually really the first YouTube tutorial I ever, I ever put online. Um, but I recommend the 50 millimeter um, on a full frame. So full frame, 50 millimeter. So if you're using a DX crop, um, if you just do, yes, yeah, so that's my YouTube channel. Um, yeah. If you do sort by the most viewed, um, it'll it'll be the top video, I think. Uh, um, oh, on the I right there, why. sort by. Whoop, farther right. No, oh, videos. videos. Click on videos. Uh -huh. <laughs> and go to the right, it'll say sort by. Oh, yeah, right, there we go. There, right. there, you go. Yeah, there we go. So, yeah, so what is the best boudoir lens? So I think it's a 50 millimeter, and um, it's it's great. It's a personal lens, uh, which is important for boudoir, but it, it's not too wide to where you get too close. But 85 millimeter is beautiful, but it's, like, too compressed. Uh, it's, it's a very loud lens is what I would call it. So I prefer the 50 millimeter. Now I shoot on a medium format Fuji GFX. And uh, I do that with a 65 millimeter because the 65 millimeter on medium format is similar to a 50 mm -hmm. on full frame. You, know, so that's what I recommend. You, also, you also have to keep in mind the space that you have as well, because if you're shooting an 85, you'll basically just get portraits and that's it. That's right. <laughs> kind of so, uh, yeah, I mean, think about your space. If you're in a small space, 35 millimeter. I mean, the, the truth is, is it depends, but that's kind of what I recommend. And then as far as best setting, you kind of work with what you have, but I think, I think light is number one. If you have good light, the rest is like bonus. Too many people yeah. think the location, they have a bunch of flower, you know, plants and they have this fancy furniture and their light's not that good. And when your light's yeah. not that good, you know, the rest doesn't matter. No, that's absolutely, you're right. It's absolute key. If you don't have good light, it doesn't matter what lens you have or, you know, what settings you use. It's just not going to look great. I find in general, if you don't have like loads of available light, the skin looks just so flat and so gray and you just don't really want that because there's nothing much you can do in post-production about it. Absolutely. So it's definitely super important. So Danny asked, um, how much heavy editing uh, are you using? Sorry, how much heavy editing like uh, using Liquify? G do for boudoir. So this is a relatively controversial topic. <laughs> mm. I don't do any liquify. I haven't used liquify in years, probably. Um, and that's a personal. Um, I think. Okay, so let's go back to boudoir. What is the purpose of boudoir? Is to is to empower women and to show mm -hmm. uh, show them that they're beautiful just the way that they are, and and all of those sort of things. So we're not trying to make an ideal picture. We're trying to show the best version of somebody. And if I'm using liquify a lot then I'm not really doing that. I'm kind of saying like after editing, after I nip this and tuck this and shrink your arms and make this bigger, um, then you look good. And that's not really, if I can tell a client like, look, I basically took out a couple of blemishes and mm -hmm. adjusted the color. And this is what you look like almost without editing internally. That's going to be a lot more powerful for them. So that's yeah. why I do it. A lot of photographers um, are on the side of, uh, you know, I do it, but not enough for the client to notice. So it's really yeah. important for them that um, that it doesn't look like it was edited. And that that works as well. Everybody's got their own way to do it. But I just, I haven't, you know, I haven't done look. And it's it's harder. I used to do it more. I wasn't as good at posing. You that's know? the thing. That's, that's what I was just going to say. I think, you know, you can literally do real life liquefying just by how you pose someone and it's just you know even from like I, I even look at you know photos that i sometimes take of myself and like how different angles affect how my body looks and it's just like it's still the same thing nothing changes within the space of 10 seconds but maybe you twist your hip a bit to the side or you stick your bum a bit more and it makes it look a certain way so instead of like liquefying but what if what if there's a situation where for example the client comes back and they're like i think i look too big can you please liquefy me uh i will I will do it then, um, but mm -hmm. I I have a conversation with them about why I why I don't think that I should. So I did have a client last year, one of the most beautiful women I photographed. She was in her kind of early forties, um, in just incredible shape, like in better shape than most of my like late twenties clients. And she, uh, you know, I showed her the pictures, and I was just like mind blown by how amazing these pictures were. And um, and she said. You know, I sent her the pictures. She's like, wow, these pictures are amazing. Can you thin out my stomach? It looks like my arm's a little big here. I can see the side of my cheek. It looks like it's a little bit bigger than this side of my cheek. 
And so I said, like, I will if you really want to. But I think you look amazing. And if I'm going to Photoshop these pictures that much, it's no longer going to be your representation of you. And I think that's kind of the whole reason why why we do this. So she said, that's fine. Go ahead and you don't have to liquefy anything. Just um, there's a couple of blemishes, you know, go ahead and take care of. So, yeah, I think that's, I think that's, I, I like doing it that way, but everybody's, yeah. everybody's different. No, but I, I feel, I feel you because when I do my photo shoots with my models, I, I don't really liquefy them either. I would way rather, you know, I know how to make them look curvy the way I want them to look curvy or not necessarily curvy, but it's just, I, I know how to show the shape of their body the way I want to show the shape of their body without having to abuse liquefy and just, you know, having to Photoshop that living crap out of them. Because then sometimes, you know, I've, I've spoken to so many models and, you know, they're so used to shooting, but there's so many times where photographers would like literally change their, the, the shape of their nose so much, for example, that they just don't even recognize themselves. And, and it's like a test and they're okay. like, I just wasted my time because it doesn't even look like me. I don't even want those photos because it just doesn't, doesn't look like you. You probably feel like there's something wrong with your nose now. That's what I'm um, saying. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's no good. <laughs> it's no so good. We, yeah, we got some we good questions a, coming in. Yeah. We have another one here. Is setting up a boudoir shoot at a hotel seen as tacky or do you find it's a good option for someone without the studio? Yeah, you can do it uh, at a hotel room. That's fine. Um, I prefer shooting in like places that look more like apartments than hotel rooms. So Airbnb is a good option. Mm -hmm. Another one is called Peer Space. Um, Peer Space has a bunch of locations in the States. I'm not sure where else it is, but um, mm -hmm. that's another good one. But yeah, I mean, there's different ways to shoot it, but whether or not it's tacky is going to really come from, you know, how, how you shoot it. Uh, so uh, that'll, that'll come with time and, and practice and trying a bunch of different things. But if a hotel is your option, then you should, you should just shoot it in a hotel. Don't let that stop you. Mm -hmm. So um, David asked, how do you get clients to shoot with uh, in LA, bigger cities in general, with so much fierce competition if you're starting new? This is difficult to grow uh, if starting now. Yeah, so this was actually a very difficult for me because I moved from Denver, which wasn't competitive, to Los Angeles, which is insanely competitive. And I had a really hard time getting clients when I first moved here. Um, so what did I have to do? So the first thing I had to do was figure out how to stand out. And the first thing I did was I rebranded. So the brand that I have now, uh, the logo with boudoir with the gold, um, that was the beginning of my new brand that was supposed to look expensive and classy and professional and, and really stand out. So that's the first thing I did. I rebranded. Then the next thing that I had to do was get better images. I had to improve my work. So <laughs> After that, I went and I uh, set up a couple of shoots with some girls in town and worked really hard to produce better work, yeah. which I was able to do. And then I stopped sharing all of my old pictures. The next thing I did was add video to my website. What did nobody, what do almost nobody have on their website? Video, good behind the scenes video, client testimonials of people talking about their experience in video. Yeah. So I did these sort of things. Then I hired somebody to take all my thoughts about boudoir and put them into something that was beautifully written. So, uh, so I spent some time with them and I was like, here's what I think about boudoir, but I'm not very good at writing. So I, I just wrote down a whole bunch of thoughts and then gave it to them and they sort of reorganized my words in a way that was what I meant to say. I just didn't know. I just didn't really know how to say it. So that was the next thing I did. Um, so essentially um, it can be done. But you have to find a way to stand out. And I know a lot of people, well, as a male photographer, how do you compete? You know, pretty much every other photographer on page one of Google is female. But that is something that stands out. Now, if somebody is interested in that or they like my work or that's something that makes me different, it's something that makes me stand out. So, um, yeah, I think it is. It's not easy, but with a lot of hard work and figuring out how to position yourself in a way that's different from the other photographers is really how you're going to, when people go to your website, when people find you, when people follow you, you're going to be more memorable and, mm -hmm. and they'll more likely book you is my advice on yeah. that. I think from my perspective as well, because I move around so much, you know, I, in the last year and a half, I've lived in five different cities and I had to start over from, you know, from scratch in five different cities. And from my perspective, just trying to get, um, 
not even clients, but just some sort of recognition, getting, you know, agencies to trust me with their models and so on. Um, you just have to make sure that if you contact people, you contact them in as like, you know, being as professional as you possibly can, be as prepared as you can, have some sort of a mood board, you know, show them what you want, show them examples of your work. Um, obviously, if you do manage to get like a test, make sure that you do as good of a job as possible because it is those first impressions that matter. If you start in a new industry and you connect with a new agency and especially starting, like if you're just starting out, start with smaller agencies if you are looking for professional models because then, you know, smaller agencies are usually easier to, to get in contact with rather than like the likes of like IMG or Ford or, you know, sometimes I still get like in touch, for example, when I was in Sydney, I was doing tests and I reached out to a bunch of agencies and the likes of IMG, they still told me that they're not interested in my work because they just, it's not their style and that's it. So you just have to make sure that you make as good of an impression as possible because if you screw up that first shoot, they'll never give you models again. That's basically what it is. So it's just like, if you have very little options, you have to make sure that you deliver. So whatever you do, just make sure that you put your best foot forward, you know, just just create strong images, have a strong mood board and and just go from there. So that's my kind of perspective. And then like once, once you start doing that, once you start doing shoots and once you start publishing them and people see them on your Instagram a lot of the time, you know, one model will see your photos and uh, you know on, on their friend's page and be like hey can i shoot with you and it's kind of how the snowball effect starts as well so let me answer uh, uh stein's question real quick uh do you well. as a male photographer get a lot of negative reaction towards your style of photography i definitely get this question a lot we talked about this a lot uh during the uh our last instagram live and uh, I'll I'll try and make it a short answer. So the so the first is uh, absolutely, especially as somebody who puts so much of their stuff out there. Uh, you know, I've been working over the last year and a half to do to grow my YouTube channel. So there's a ton of people who have seen it. More people have seen my work um, in boudoir than there's not a whole lot of other boudoir photographers sharing like I am. So uh, absolutely, I get it. Uh, I get it all the time. Um, but. That is a reality outside of, of where I actually operate. So like these clients here, these two clients have nothing negative to say about my work. In fact, they're grateful that I took the time to become a boudoir photographer and give them this experience. Now they have pictures that will last them a lifetime. So what you really have to do is just know that there's certain people you're creating for and certain people you're not creating for. No, nobody's not there's not a single person in this world who doesn't have someone who doesn't like what they're doing. Uh, Oprah or, you know, even New York times bestselling books still have one star reviews. Like there's, there's no way around it. If you're trying to live a life where you won't have any negative comments, you can't, it's just not possible. That's like the whole thing. Like if to, to not offend anybody means you can't go outside of your house. So, as long as you, you know, stay true to why you're doing this in the first place, if people are going to judge, you just kind of have a conversation with them on, on why you're doing what you're doing. And if, if they don't understand it or they don't hear it, or they, you know, still think that you're um, a ridiculous person or whatever, they just very deep in their system throughout life. They just can't imagine um, like a positive scenario for you doing that. And because of that, you're never going to convince that person. And it's it's not really your job to. So you just move on to the next person that will see what you're doing and um, and love your work or be appreciative of the experience that you give or, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What's next? Um, so uh, someone asked, uh, which ways do you recommend for finding models to start your portfolio? Um, I put out a course on this actually when I was in Hawaii and Bali, um, I recorded all my Instagram messages. Uh, I like screen yeah. recorded them so you could see like the exact words that I use to send messages. And I did it from an account that had like 3000 followers instead of 60,000. And, um, and I did it with that account with only like three or four boudoir pictures on it to sort of level the playing field. But, um, Pretty much uh, everywhere is how I would recommend to do it. Uh, you can make posts on Craigslist in local photography Facebook groups. You can do it uh, on Instagram. You can message people. You try and find uh, women with or models with fewer than 10,000 followers. 
uh, that have pictures that show that they are in front of the camera a lot, not just selfies. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do a bunch of uh, a bunch of different things, but again, friends, friends of friends, um, put together a, like a Pinterest list or an Instagram mm -hmm. saved list of photos you'd like to recreate. So even if you don't know how to create them yourself, you can say, this is the look that I'm going for. And if somebody feels comfortable with that, if they like that, then they can say, cool, let's, let's try this together. So those are a couple of my main tips on, on starting your portfolio. Yeah, no, I agree with most of that. I think it's just, it's very important to um, just kind of, I think be very prepared when you're contacting models, especially if you don't have a portfolio. I think it's very important to try and find stuff that is very simple and classy. I find, especially like I did it when I was starting out, I just overcomplicated things a lot where it didn't need to be overcomplicated. Um, so just keep it simple. Don't go overboard with like hair and makeup. Just keep it nice and clean, nice, simple photos. And that will get you way more traction rather than, you know, doing like oh, massive hair, makeup, crazy styling. Cause it's just, it doesn't usually work. And like, nobody wants to see it, especially model agencies. They want to let you see the, the barest photos and it's boring from your perspective. But once you build that trust, you will be able to do your, your fancy projects that you want to do because the model agency will get stuff and then you'll get stuff. Um, another question. So I wanted to circle back to your, um, to your educational courses because yeah. you do quite a lot of them. I'm going to pop them on the screen just here. One second. So it's, um, there we go. Um, it's your boudoir. Acceler acceler accelerate. How do you pronounce Accelerator. it? Accelerator. Accelerator, Jesus. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is your course here. And um, you have this lovely page here that just shows what's going to be in the course and so on. So how much do you think your your life and your career has changed since launching those, those courses? Like, are they really successful? Is it something that you're really proud of? Is it something that brings you income and like a very you know because obviously with with having an online product it's a great way to make money yeah absolutely so uh so basically and i'll, and I'll do this um as far as uh let's see e es catch a sketch asked a question um because i think that'll lead into the course material mm -hmm. uh the description of this video reads how to start your own boudoir business and earn six figures in that spirit, how much would you say is your average sale minus costs uh, for hair and makeup? So I'll be really, I'm just going to be super transparent here with um, with income as far as uh, my boudoir photography is concerned. So my, my photo shoot, including hair and makeup, is $500. That does not include any of the pictures. Mm -hmm. um, hair and makeup, I pay $175. So I take home $325. And then they purchase pictures on top of that. I pretty much always sell albums. My smallest album is a thousand dollars, so that's pretty much the least that they can walk out spending is fifteen hundred dollars if they want to shoot with me. However, my average, uh, so in that video that uh, she had up on boudoircourses.com, shows uh, my average. It actually goes through my bank statement and and shows you the uh, my my sales on my clients, and the average that I'm that I'm earning is about thirty seven hundred dollars. Uh, per client, per individual photo shoot that I do is about $3,700. If you subtract the cost of hair and makeup and an album, I probably get to take home $3,300 of that. So that is um, that is as far as, uh, you know, kind of averages, what to expect as far as uh, earnings. For my business, it didn't always used to be like that. It used to be much less. But since I found a lot of success, and since um, I started to share, so the first thing that I shared, so I used to be a professional videographer as well. I used to do weddings. I did destination weddings, uh, Cabo, uh, Spain. I shot in Puerto Rico uh, and that was amazing. And then when I started shooting boudoir, I had this skill of video and a lot of boudoir photographers didn't know how to do that. So my very first course that I created was teaching photographers how to shoot video. And that worked really, really well. And then I decided I wanted to help guys. I want to help uh, male photographers be able to start their business because there's like no information out there about that. So I put together another course for that. And that was okay. But I realized I started getting questions from like everybody. And a lot of women were like, wait a second, can I use this course? I'm trying to start my boudoir business, but I'm not a guy. What, you know, will this apply for me? So I added a ton more information and that has become the boudoir accelerator course, which is on sale right now for 
for less than it should be. But during the quarantine, I figured everybody's got to stay home. I wanted to give back. So to answer your question on that, um, the courses have been amazing. If you are on that page, you can go through and see if you scroll to the bottom there. I just want to show some, um, mm -hmm. some testimonials and some success stories from people yeah. uh, that are doing it. So this person on the left, they book nine sessions in a month. Uh, people are getting their very first paid photo shoots. I've got my phone script so that Donald Duck is, um, I have my phone script in there. So when a client calls, I go through my exact order. This person's got a first thousand dollar client. Um, on the right there, you've got somebody got a bunch of awkward silences while he was shooting. Now the posing guide, he doesn't have any more awkward silences during the photo shoot. Um, mm -hmm. On the right, booked another one with the phone script. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of them. There's a lot. There's a lot. And it's so cool to see because it means, it means what worked for me works for other people. And it means that, you know, boudoir, it's like, I just love it. You must love what you do, right? You just like shooting and creating is just something that's so special. And for me, boudoir is something that is so special. So I feel really lucky that I, that's been able to become my every day. Right. And I, mm -hmm. Um, and I've received so much from so many other photographers that I now want to give, I want to share. I want other people to be able to have the freedom to, um, you know, to create what they want to create and have the creative control. Like we were talking about with the light in your space, whatever you want to do and, uh, make an impact on these, on these people, the before and after pictures and watch them transform and all that stuff. So I've worked really hard to put that, uh, to put that together and it is profitable. It's absolutely profitable. The, uh, the idea of, of selling something online you can scale it. So $3,700 is amazing. Um, and it takes me about seven hours per client from like first mm -hmm. phone call to delivering their albums about seven hours with them, which is amazing amount per hour. But it's also, if I, you know, if I want to take the month of October off and go to Bali and create a new course, I know that I can still have some income happening from sharing, sharing my knowledge, sharing my presets, things like that, uh, to support me outside of, outside of just doing photo shoots. So it's been great in like every possible way. Um, yeah. It's been awesome. I think in just in general for like, from my perspective as well, um, because, you know, I've, I've had my online product as well. And now I'm working on the, on the course as well, like on action three courses. So one of them is just going to be like a photography, just like a general photography course where I talk about how to be the most efficient with light and so on. Second one is going to be posing, strictly like posing models, how to get the best out of your model, how to have like, you know, kind of go to poses that are relatively easy. And then the third one will be actually how to start working with models and model agencies and how to approach them and so on. And I think from my perspective, having an online product is so valuable because as you said, like even even in a situation like this, I am here in Ireland, you know, I am stuck not being able to do what I usually do. And the, the chance is I won't be able to do it for another probably few months, which could be obviously pretty daunting for me, for my channel, because I won't have the content that I would usually do. Thankfully, I do have backlogs of work that I can still post, so it's fine. But at the same time, I still have the digital product to push me through. And Every single time I talk to photographers, everybody is like, "Oh, I have no money. I'm I'm not making any money." And and it's, I know. it's so stressful. And it's just well, like, yeah, you know. I, I mean, mean I my the, the very first part of that is that I think it's it's amazing to have income right now. You know, you're planning on your month to month, but I think creatives have a hard time saving money and being good with their money and taking a portion yeah. of their income put it into savings. Ideally mm -hmm. you have six months. I mean, this is like a whole other conversation, but I'll, I'll just mention this. Ideally you have six months of savings so that if you lose your job, or you lose your house or whatever happens, you can live and you can pay your mortgage and you can do that for six months while you're transitioning yeah. to more income. Not a whole lot of people are doing that. And um, it takes a lot of knowledge to be good with your money, but it takes a lot of like, how do you book enough clients now and earn enough money now from your photography to save up money so that if something like this happens, you don't have to, you know, be in the red. You don't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be scary and stressful. Yeah. Um, but obviously having online products to, to give you income while you're not able to shoot is also very beneficial. Yeah, for sure. So someone asked, um, what do you do if you shoot natural light at the beach at noontime and sun comes against the sea view? I wait for four hours. 
<laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's things you could do. You could, you could genuinely, you know, I mean, you could you could go into the water and just shoot from that side if you need to. I've done that before, where I was okay. like up up to here and water and like my camera here. Uh, but to be honest, I think I think in this kind of situation in general, I just wouldn't shoot at noon. So I think it's just down to your planning and making sure that you don't do that. Because working with the with the midday sun is really really challenging, regardless of if you're just starting or if you're going for it. Like I genuinely never shoot around noon. I always finish my shoots by like ten thirty in the morning, and then don't start shooting again until like at least two or three in the afternoon. Absolutely, I have uh, I have a video on my YouTube channel that says uh, it's tips for taking pictures at noon, and the first tip is don't do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And then there's three or four other tips on on ways to uh, on ways to deal with that. And we literally shot at noon. So the first thing is, if you're the photographer, if you're in control, you can tell people we're just not shooting at noon. If that's the literally the only time that they can do it, there's it's not a, a high enough priority for them. Mm -hmm. But if you do want us to do a search for like how to shoot at noon, we do it on the beach it's in Hawaii, um, and I show a couple of uh, a couple of tips there. Mm -hmm. so someone um asked what is better to work for an agency or get your own models and how do you get to work with an agency uh well again from my perspective i kind of book 50 50 depending where where i am if i'm in bali i actually book most of my models through instagram i don't really um worry that much about agencies like if they are like a lot of models are signed with agencies but i feel like in bali nobody really cares it's just like they're not on strict contracts there so it's just they they're basically able to just do all their freelance work without any problems um so i'd usually just book them through instagram and just go about it this way um if i work with the model agency it's obviously good because usually it's just a bit a bit safer from your perspective because you know sometimes when you book a, book a model directly she'll be like oh i got a headache i got a sore thumb and you know my eye popped out, my grandmother died, you know, it's just like, there's so many excuses, but when you're, when a model is bound by the agency, it's usually a bit more professional and everything is usually organized a bit better. Um, so there's definitely ups and downs to both. As I said, it depends what kind of industry you're in. When I was in LA, for example, doing tests, I literally just, um, I, I kind of went both ways. I spoke to some agencies and then I spoke to models directly. The only problem is when I get into a new industry, like LA, for example, because I was just starting out with those agencies and I had no credibility with them, even though they saw my work, they would give me like the bottom of the barrel models, which I wasn't necessarily so happy with. And then at the same time, I was able to find the models that work for them, contact them on Instagram and then get them to be like, oh yeah, sure, it's amazing. And then usually what you do then is once the girl is like, yeah, I'd love to shoot with you, whatever, she gives you her agent's contact and then you contact the agent and be like, hey, I spoke to your model on Instagram. We would love to shoot together, but obviously I wanted to ask you for permission first, ish. <laughs> and then usually it works out this way. So um, I think nice. it's the most, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a roundabout way but it usually works. Okay, so uh, we've just reached an hour, so I think we're gonna wrap up soon. If there's any last questions, I'll give you guys like two more minutes to ask questions and then we'll we'll be we'll be getting on with our day or with my night. I can't wait for some wine. <laughs> <laughs> I've given yeah. myself a rule that I can only drink wine every second night, not every night. Oh, that's a good um, one. Yeah, it's just like, you know, like before I came to, like from back from Bali, I would literally never have wine. Like I was never a wine person. And now I was just like, it's quarantine. I can drink every night. It's good. Like, I'm really oh. good. I had a couple of rum and Cokes uh, oh. about two or three weeks ago. But uh, okay. Yeah, so I should have the same rule, but for Netflix. Oh, yes. I just, you know, I just, I'm kind of at this point where I'm just like, everything goes, whatever keeps me happy. I'm kind of like a toddler right now. It's just like, whatever keeps me happy, I just do it for myself. I'm like the mother and the baby at the same time. So, um, thoughts on boudoir and videos. Do boudoir videos have a place? Um, are boudoir videos getting popular versus photos like 30 seconds or one, two minute clips? Yeah. So, about 20, actually, this client, she bought a boudoir video as well. Um, about, 20 to 30% of my clients end up doing boudoir videos. Actually, it won't, you don't have to play any of them, but if you go to my website, there's a video tab. So you could just show them real quick. Yeah. Um, this oh, is, uh, this is something that I, I mean, I, I think I saw a couple of cool, sexy videos on Vimeo and I was like, I wonder if I could do that. And I, and I did. 
and I and now I've just been doing them for a while. Um, so where are we going? Uh, videos. Videos at the top. And then you've got all about boudoir. Those are behind the scenes videos of me and the experience um, mm -hmm. my shoot I did on BuzzFeed, client testimonials, people opening up albums. If you go all the way up to the top again, and then yeah. you choose client videos. So scroll over videos and then do client mm -hmm. videos. Yeah. So these are um, uh, clients. Here's, uh, you know, you got your everyday women from, from one thing or another, Stasi from uh, Vanderpump Rules. Uh, you've got um, a couple different people. Anyways, uh, yeah, absolutely. So videos are absolutely becoming more popular. There's good videos and bad videos, just like good good photos and bad photos. Um, but that's what I charge. It's uh, it's about 90 seconds to two minutes. And it's part of uh, – it's like the top package that they can get. Or they can get just a boudoir video. Every once in a while I'll have somebody come in and it's like, I already did photos and it was great, but I want to do something different and unique. I want to do a video. Great. You totally, you totally should. Uh, and so we do that. And that's actually, so that was the first course that I ever came out with teaching boudoir photographers, how to shoot video. And, um, it's, it's awesome. It's super fun. It's super fun. And uh, I think it's also I, cool because with video, you can kind of portray the person so many different ways because all that it's down to like the music you pick, the editing, the cuts, like even the more, most subtle movement can uh, look the most sensual. Um, and I find that with even my swim where it's like, I, I actually really enjoy doing videos and like even behind the scenes because there's something special about it because with photos, you just freeze that one frame in and that's it. But with video, it brings back so many more memories. Even if you look like, you know, even if you have like wedding photos versus wedding video, it's like, I know myself. I've been, I've been there, been, been married and divorced. So I know the difference between my wedding photos and my wedding videos <laughs> and the wedding videos always bring back so many more uh, like emotions and just like, you know, and you kind of get taken back to that day. So I guess it's kind of the same with video. You kind of get taken back to that kind of situation. So uh, Marina asked, is it okay to do more than one type of photography example, food photography with fashion and boudoir? I feel like it's tricky. It's like, of course you can, you can do whatever you, the hell you want if you want to do all the kinds of photography but in general i feel the most specialized you get in something the better it's going to be because it's like people want to know you for this one particular thing and it's like i cannot i cannot imagine michael being a food photographer versus boudoir photographer or like I'd both i need the food before before i shot it yeah so it's just like i think it's it's a it's a tricky one it obviously depends if it's something like fashion and boudoir I guess it's okay because it's a bit closer, but I feel like with photography, at least for me, in terms of like fashion, swimwear, beauty, even like even though it all requires shooting models, it's such a different outlook on every single aspect of it. I would never shoot photography like um, fashion photography the same way I would shoot swimwear because you know with swimwear you have to be more sensual, you have to be a bit more like you know. Um, sexy in a way you have to be able to like sell the bikini but with fashion that's more about the clothing how it moves how it bends and it's, it's the same here it's just like if you do something so extreme like let's say food and boudoir it's just i i don't know i don't know if it's the best idea my short answer on that is um i mean shoot shoot whatever you want mm -hmm. um i wouldn't put food and boudoir on the same website i would oh, have separate sure, yeah. brands mm -hmm. um there's a term, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. And basically what that means is that if you're good at a lot of things, you can't be really good at just one thing. So uh, that's why specialists can charge more money. So the easiest, the simplest uh, difference is like a handyman versus a plumber. A handyman's 25 bucks an hour, a plumber's $100 an hour. The handyman can do a bunch of different jobs, but if you need specifically something that a plumber can do, you're going to spend more money on the plumber. So yeah. same for photography. I hear a lot. I, I literally, I wish I recorded this conversation because this woman's getting married and she wants to do, um, she wanted to do a boudoir shoot, but she said she didn't want to hire somebody who also did weddings because um, their work, you know, they haven't, they probably haven't done as many boudoir shoots. They don't specialize in it. They probably mm -hmm. haven't worked with as many different types of people, but I do only boudoir. So she, her first time shooting, she wanted somebody who specializes in boudoir. So that's yeah. one of the benefits to, to niching down, especially on your website um, and in your brand. And then the other thing uh, is it 
um, allows you to speak. Everything on your website can speak specifically towards that. If you're trying to sell somebody on food and on boudoir, you can't say, um, I really started photography because of X, because of Y, um, because food photographers, somebody who's hiring a food photographer doesn't care. And then on the opposite side, you know, placing food in every detail, like somebody who's hiring you for boudoir doesn't care. So it just allows yeah. your messaging to be very direct. I feel like I feel like in general, it's easier for you to be able to at the beginning when you're still exploring and you don't really know what you like. It's nice to try different things and see. But I think down the line, you see what sticks with you the most. And it was kind of with me when I started, I would mainly just do fashion but i would also kind of dabble in beauty and all this kind of stuff and then i started doing swimwear and i'm like wow i really like doing that i really enjoyed this and i would way rather do swimwear than fashion or beauty or any of the other ones and as michael mentioned i think it's just i think it just creates a much stronger identity when you do decide to settle on one particular type of work and it kind of creates so much of a stronger um, portfolio for yourself as well so i think it's just much better to Try, if you can't decide at the beginning, that's fine. Try and do different things and see what sticks. But I think eventually down the line, you do kind of decide what makes you the most happy. So, okay. Um, last question from David, just about, uh, are either of you preparing for the Canon R5? Thinking of changing the system with Air RF lenses. I just find the RF system quite pricey. Um, I'm probably going to buy it when it comes out. I just bought this EOS RP. That's what this is getting filmed on. Um, oh, I, is, that, is that, is that the thing where you can film your broadcasts from your Canon? Cause I saw an article yeah. about it. So this is, uh, that's you know, great. This is my, this is my EOS RP yeah. in, my, in my space. And, um, it's awesome. Uh, it looks really good. I got the flip out screen. It's plugged into my yeah. computer. Um, I've been shooting Sony for two years. Uh, so this is the Sony. I bought the Sony a nine when it came out. I've loved that system and I use it a bunch. Now I'm on the Fuji GFX, um, which I absolutely love. So if I buy the R5, it's not going to be for pictures. It's just going to be for video. Mm -hmm. um, I just want full frame 4K, you know, video with a flip out screen and image stabilization. Yeah. So at least for me, that's that's why I'm buying it. Um, but I know a handful of people who are switching over. I haven't really had a chance to test out the RF glass, but I mean... Yeah, I mean, no. I, could I, I could possibly consider it. I've, as I, as I mentioned in my in my lives on Instagram, I have been my camera has been a bit beat up, so I think it's kind of approaching that time to upgrade. But I haven't. I I need to see the specs. I need to see what it's like, and then I'll make a decision. I probably won't be buying anything until this situation is over, until we know what's happening. Because at the moment, there's no point in me spending time or spending money on any kind of gear because I'm just not going to use it. So. I think that's where we are. Okay, we're going to wrap it up because we've been going on for like an hour and 12 minutes. Thank you so much for joining me, Michael. It was great. Thank you so much for everyone who asked questions and who participated. It was lovely. Um, please let me know if there's anyone else you'd like to see. And in the meantime, um, I'm going to publish this and all the links are going to be down below so you can see the courses, um, Michael's um, Instagram website and all the other stuff so make sure to check him out check out the course as well because it's great i know because i've seen it um and yeah thank you so much for joining and just chilling with us so have a good night everyone and enjoy your the rest of your day bye-bye so much uh